Tonight on the Crew Reviews, we welcome Greg Hurwitz, author of 21 novels, including the best-selling Orphan X series. Greg is also an accomplished screenwriter and comic book writer. A graduate of Harvard University with a master's from Oxford University, Mr. Hurwitz has found success at nearly every turn. That success will be challenged tonight as he appears on the Crew Reviews. Welcome, uh, Greg Hurwitz, to the show, creator of Orphan X and his giant dogs, um, which yeah. are welcome on, on the air. <laughs> Always welcome. Cheers. Cheers to the dog. Cheers to the dogs, exactly. Hello. What's that dog weigh? 125 pounds. All right. right. Big, that's, nice. that's, that's Eric Bishop's weight. That's good. Mm. No, it's, I wish it was. That was me in college. <laughs> Dang. That's what he curls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Greg, our, our viewers are pretty well versed and well read in, in thrillers, but because time is finite, there might be a few that haven't gotten around to your stuff yet. So, can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of Evan Smoke and um, how would you describe him as a character? One of the things that I've loved with thrillers is using them as an excuse for continuing education. Like, a lot of people come from this approach of saying, write what you know. But for me, that would be really boring. Like, I like to use thrillers to sort of shine a light into all the dark corners of anything that ever fascinated me. And so because of that, you know, I've, I've gone undercover in a mind control cult, right? I've gone up and stunned airplanes. I've gone on the demolition ranges with SEALs and blown up cars. And I have a really great Rolodex. And one of the things I noticed is a lot of my friends who were former CIA, former spec ops, were talking about black programs and how they function, how they recruit, how they fund them, how everyone's in their own silo and separate from information. And I just had this, this notion of like, what would it be like if I created and made plausible a black program that took kids out of foster homes, kids who nobody wants, and used them as basically disposable weapons. They're full cutout men. No one really cares if something happens to them. And they're trained up to do to go where the United States government can't and to commit missions and assassinations that we're not allowed to. And if they ever get caught, they're on their own. They can get tortured to pieces in a cell somewhere and they don't know anything. And so I think that was the sort of starting notion of it. And then the books are about a lot more. It's like every year I learn more of what they're about for me personally. And that's so weird because a lot of times I'll write a book and a year or two years later, I'll look back at it and go, oh, it's so obvious what I was dealing with psychologically or emotionally, mm -hmm. right? Like I wrote a book called You're Next. And a year or two later, I look back and went, oh, obviously that's about some of the terror and vulnerability for me of being a parent, right? And so, but mm -hmm. if I was writing it, I'm just thinking of the story that I'm writing, right? And so there's a lot of elements that are really personal in Orphan X. And I think it's one of the reasons why it sort of connected is as I keep peeling back the layers of the onion in subsequent books, there's a through line that's consistent because I think it's a lot of things that I deal with emotionally and psychologically in my own life. And so the interesting notion of having this guy who is, you know, raised by the 10 commandments, his handler, Jack Jones gives him the 10 assassins commandments, sort of breaking out of a defined definition of himself and seeking his way towards be, it's almost like he's Pinocchio and he wants to be a real boy. Right. Yeah. Right. He's, he's an archetypal character like the ones we love, like Jack Reacher and James Bond and Jason Bourne, who sort of has an awareness that he is an archetypal character. And so I set the series in the real world. He lives in, in a, in a you know, residential high rise in LA among other people. And he's constantly interacting with real people and being pulled away from perfection towards intimacy and all the messy complexities of human life and human interaction which he is, is completely undone about. Like he can calculate, you know, the wind drift on a sniper round, but he's completely undone if it comes to making small talk at the mail slots with Ida Rosenbaum, the annoying, you know, elderly Jewish lady who lives upstairs, um, who may or may not be based on my dead grandma. <laughs> Got it. Do we need to edit that out? Uh, no. 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 Beautiful. She's not around anymore. She can't hold it against me. <laughs> so you did well, kind of partially answer my, my next question um but you know the, the crowd the thriller field is pretty crowded and a lot of times it's hard to distinguish one protagonist from another 
um, where they're all, you know, they're all kind of the hero that are going to save the world and their special forces. And there's a lot of times they have very similar, you know, backgrounds, similar personality traits. Evan does not. So how did you, how did you decide what traits to use for him? And then was there maybe any like, besides your dead grandmother, was there anyone that you, you know, you, you draw on to take that trait and put in, put in that character of Evan Smoke? Hmm. Well, I mean, this is the stuff I come back to later that's so obvious. You know, when I started high school, I was this, so I was from this sort of atheist Jewish background, right? Like Northern California, very, very liberal. And I went to an all boys Catholic high school where I knew nobody. And I was the smallest kid out of 1300 kids at the school. And the school is a big sports, you know, sports and academic power. No, no pressure. I literally was like 5'2", 97 pounds starting high school. <laughs> and it's so funny because I look back at it and it's like, oh, well, who's Evan? He's the smallest kid from the foster home that he grew up in. He's the least likely one to be chosen, right? Everything with him is about his grit and determination. Um, it's not that he's the biggest guy like Reacher or the smoothest guy with the women like James Bond, right? Or the best mm -hmm. or like... Um, um, Bubbly swagger. Bubbly swagger, right. Yeah. He's kind of got to be Ulysses. He's got to bring the totality of who he is and this sort of grit and determination to any, to any mission that he's going to go on. And a lot of it starts and ends with his character. A lot of it starts with who he is at the baseline. And when you strip down all that, there's a line. He was rescued from the foster home by his handler. His name is Jack Johns. And there's a line when Jack tells him when he's 12 years old, the hard part isn't making you a killer. The hard part is keeping you human. And for me, that's sort of like the, um, that's the line around which the whole series coalesces. It's all about him maintaining his humanity and all the things that will test him there. Cause we know all the things that can test him with, you know, in a mission, we've seen a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot more of that came from me, but on the surface, you know, it's like Evan Smoke is so much more impressive and better than I am in all ways. So it's, it's, <laughs> It's not obvious. I don't mean it as a flattering comparison, but there's a lot about the, the, the ways that the path that I've had to forge, like everyone's got their own path to the light, right? Everyone's got their own version of overcoming their vulnerabilities. Everyone's got their own version of dealing with what are your weaknesses? And all of our strengths are our weaknesses. We've known that since the Greeks and certainly Shakespeare. Yeah. And what are the ways that all of us try to find those and understand the things that, 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 might call to us for greatness, might also undo us and make us small and diminish us. Yeah. He's a character who's really dealing with that. And then the pieces of the other characters, like there's a character called Tommy Stojak, who is uh, uh, his armorer and he supplies him his guns. And he's, I can now say, is based on a, a dear friend of mine called Billy Stojak. I took his last name because uh, he passed away. He was an armorer. He's an early UDT diver. Amazing, amazing guy. Just brimming with personality. And, you know, he was a big inspiration for Tommy. Um, and, you know, he's sort of a legend in the spec ops community. And so I wove him into that and the pieces of him that overlap with the pieces of Evan. So in all of Evan's interactions, I wanted to make a character who everyone who interacts with him, because he's not the best, everyone is, is better than him in that one lane. And so it's really fun. So like Tommy could make fun of him for being a mouth breathing trigger puller, right? <laughs> no guns and, he goes with Joey, who I introduced in Hellbent, who's a 16-year-old hacker. And she makes fun of him for being like an old guy who can't set the, the, the time on his VCR if he had to, right? Because she's such a superior hacker. So while I've presented a character who's ostensibly very impressive, it's fun to have all these other characters who that whenever he interacts with them can undercut and kind of undermine him. And there's opportunities for humor there, right? Yeah. Um, and that was important to me too. And that's another part of that archetypal character who is in the process of realization that he's, he's sort of too rigid. And it, it's something I think a lot of people deal with where there's some point in your thirties or forties that you wake up and go, God, I haven't significantly updated my worldview or priorities or values. Mm -hmm. Like in my case, since I was maybe 12 or 13, hmm. and I'll look at them all and go, does this still suit me? Like a lot of these got me really far but is this what I want? Is this the rest of the future that I want? And mm -hmm. it's turned out that this is the saga that I'm writing. Yeah. Interesting. And that Great. saga continues with your uh, latest book into the fire. 
a Norfin X novel, which is slated to come out January 28th, 2020. So can you give us, uh, us in the audience, a little bit of the premise of that book? Well, so Out of the Dark was, is my, the, the, the last book is my homage to Day of the Jackal, which is one of my favorite thrillers. It's sort of the biggest scale Orphan X squaring off with the President of the United States um, in the most impossible mission, going up against the most heavily protected human being on the planet. And I thought that after that, I wanted to do a different approach because it's like, what's next, right? You do Moonraker and set it in outer space. It's like, you don't want to <laughs> go big. And what I really wanted was a clean reset for the series where Evan goes home, he's in Castle Heights, he's embedded in Castle Heights as the residential tower where he lives among all these people. And I just wanted it to start off like it's a normal mission. Because in the past, he gets a phone call as the nowhere man. You know, someone calls the one to nowhere. He's on the other end. Do you need my help? And he's there as a kind of pro bono assassin to help other people. And I wanted it to be a straight mission story. But the thing is with this mission, it was sort of based on that nursery uh, rhyme or nursery song where, of, the, of the person who swallowed the spider to catch the fly, where... The problem starts small and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So it was a sort of unusual build where I wanted to start off with something where you go, okay, like this seems like a good case for Evan. It's a nowhere man mission. But the reversals and the, um, the sort of upgrades in action and stakes and peril and danger eventually put him in a position where he has to undertake one of the most basically the most dangerous move that he's ever done um, as the nowhere man in order to help his client. So what starts off with something that feels like it should be manageable in the wake of the series and the missions that have come before winds up being one of the things that he has to take on the most personally, the most danger in order to see, to see this through. And that was sort of the template that I thought about it. Um, it's a different way to structure a thriller and I had a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. Nice. It, it's funny. You, and these guys can attest. You pretty much verbatim answered my next question, which is about going from the scale of out <laughs> of the dark. Right Thanks, Greg. The scale out, no, that's great. <laughs> scale out of the dark to uh, into the fire. Um, did you know when you were writing out of the dark that you were going to do that? Or was that kind of like you finished the book and you're like, well, where the hell do I go now? And, oh, I got to go back kind of to the <laughs> smaller scale. Or, or You know, I usually know the next one or the next one or two, at least the shape of it, right? And then when I dig in, it starts to expand. And every time I feel like I'm in trouble, like if I'm going into a book, like it happened with the one I'm working on now where I'm like, I don't have the next one. And I, and I always have it ahead of time. It's, it's weird because they tend to be, you know, like they're not obvious because the story occurs to me first and then it'll, it'll be something that I'm, I'm really grappling with or dealing with. And then, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you know, I, I do work on a, on a bunch of different fronts, right? I do TV, I do comics, I do features, I do novels, I do, um, I'm involved in politics, some sort of working against the grain of polarization uh, and political discourse. And so I have all this rangy stuff. And sometimes when I'm, when things are working well, it feels like everything's aligned where I feel like I'm having or dealing with the same issue in my personal life, in my relationships, in the Orphan X book, in a script that I'm working on, in the conversations that I'm having with, let's say, presidential candidates. Like, it becomes this really weird thing where, where if I'm paying attention enough, it's sort of like a common theme pushes its way to the surface in all areas of my life. And I think most people, we experience this at different times where you're like, God, everything went wrong today. Like, we can recognize it when everything's not working, right? Where you have one of those days that, you know, someone scrapes your car and you're late for the thing and you miss an appointment. And like, we all know that feeling, but there's another feeling sometimes if, if, if I really am trying to pay attention where it feels like all of the problems that I'm dealing with or, or issues that I'm grappling with or trying to figure out all, all kind of become aligned in a weird way. And then I can deal with the same thing through everything. And so with these books, one of the things that's been so interesting is seeing the, the things that Evan is contending with are often themes I'm dealing with in my own life, but I don't, I don't mm -hmm. quite realize it. And then they push to the surface. I don't know. Do you have, have you ever had an experience like that? Or am I just like a, yeah, probably, probably not uh, in that many different uh, forums because I don't think I'm in that many forums, but absolutely where, where it seems like whatever's popping up in your professional life is in your personal life. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
it's like being in the zone for whatever, wherever yeah. you're at that point. Yep. Yeah. And it's weird. Cause it's almost like, you know, so, so that's been a large part of the process for me as, as I'm writing and working on something with Evan, the, like Hellbent, you know, was really about him. The third Orphan X book was about him losing a father figure and then being forced to become a father figure to Joe. Right. And there was yeah. sort of thematic balance about him being at the sort of tipping point in his life where he's losing Jack, who's the only person who ever treated him like a human. And Jack's last mission is to put him in charge of Joey Morales, who's this teenage smart ass hacker. It's the last person ever. He wants to go full man on fire. He wants to just kill everybody who had anything <laughs> with getting near Jack. And all of a sudden there's this kid in the mix, complicated everything, and she's got yeah. strengths and weaknesses, talents and drawbacks, and she's muddied emotionally like everybody is. And it becomes this whole conundrum. And it was funny because, you know, as I look at writing that, it's like I'm writing that at a point in my own life where you start to tilt into, you know, the middle part of your life. Those are some of the things you start thinking about where you, you're, you're looking um, back towards how you help people, how you put a hand out, what your responsibilities are shift, and you're kind of looking back to pull people along instead of looking forward to be pulled forward, right? And so there's a yeah. lot of that that, that – that come through um and into the dark actually ends with a huge twist ending the last line um because in, in i'm sorry into the fire the fire yeah the very uh, last line that's pretty impressive <laughs> right so what i wanted to do is like take him through it's like this could be his last mission he just wants the last mission to end right and he keeps telescoping and telescoping and telescoping and we get to the very end and he's finally vision go free and free and clear and then there's what i want to do is wind up with you know, a last scene that puts everything we thought we knew about him on his head and go, well, what's going to happen next? Nice. But maybe that's it. Maybe I'll just move on. I'll retire, do some fishing. Oh boy. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend it. Um, all right. Well, let's go back uh, a little bit further back. Um, you went to a small East Coast college, I, Harvard. I, I, Harvard, I think I'm pronouncing Never that. heard of it. Never heard so, of it. Some small place out there. Um, when you went in as an undergrad, and the degree path that you went, was that an, was that an intentional decision process that you were going to go into the publishing and, and, and media world after graduation? Or was that a mind shift after the fact? It was, was that a conscious choice up front where you're going or did you find your way there? Um, it's a really interesting question. Like I knew I wanted to be a novelist for as far back as I can remember. Like my mom tells stories of me sleeping with the dictionary. Um, not in a carnal sense, um, but <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever. Works. I, was I was just, and I, and I wasn't allowed to watch TV growing up unless the Red Sox were playing because my dad's from Boston and that's religion. Yeah, you know, yeah. or if there was a Hitchcock movie on, I always say, like, those two things, if you add bourbon, explains like 90% of my personality. <laughs> um, <laughs> until I was obsessed with books. I read Stephen King, like, by fifth grade, I was reading Peter Benchley and Stephen King. Wow. It's the only thing I wanted to do. And so there was this overlap where it wasn't sort of this pragmatic choice, but I studied English and psychology, right? Yeah. And it's the perfect major, I'd say for me, to embark on stories and narrative. I did Jungian and Freudian analysis of Shakespearean tragedy. And so Shakespearean tragedy is, is essentially crime fiction, right? Like yeah. tales, you know, highly structured convention bound tales of lust, intrigue and murder right, from sources that have been reinvented and re reinvigorated, right? The Merchant of Venice is the Jew of Malta. Like, the only, the only play he wrote without source material is The Tempest. And so that's what you get when you get Michael Conley or Robert Crace revisiting Robert B. Parker, who's revisiting Chandler, right? Who's, it's not like these themes that we come up with are, are, are like experimental forms. Right. And, and Freud, you know, Freud's case studies, they're like perfect short stories. Right. And, yeah, true. and Carl Jung didn't, you know, all he wrote about was narrative and the structure of narrative. So in hindsight, it's like, oh, of course, this is all clear as day of, of this combination. But at the time, I was really only choosing things that were um, of, of the most fascination and interest to me. Um, and it's funny. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Steve Jobs gave this commencement speech at Stanford. Have you guys ever seen it? I Part of it. Yeah, he talks about how if you follow the things that you love, they make no sense going forward. But if you look back, there's a perfect path. Right. One of the stories he tells is how 
I think he was at Stanford and he, you know, dropped a class or something and he wandered in and there was a class on like, you know, like antique printing press fonts or something. He was like, this is <laughs> he went and he took it as. And of course on Mac, you have all these different fonts and proliferation that weren't before, right? So it's this little weird point of interest for him. Right. And who knows where the stuff's going to lead. And I think my education was a lot of that. I started writing my first novel, which is called The Tower, when I was 19 years old. I was an undergrad still. Um, I got really lucky and, and, and sold it out of the gates. Wow. Um, but so I was in it and wanting to do it, but I was very focused on what are the things of the most interest. And that involved, you know, all my electives. I was like, I love Frank Lloyd Wright. So I took a class on architecture. I took a class mm -hmm. on opera. I was really just doing everything that was the most interesting and figuring, you know, you see a lot. And look, I'm out in LA, you know, I do screenwriting and TV. And you see a lot of times where people are like, I want to be a screenwriter. I studied screenwriting. I got a master's in screenwriting. And here I am as a screenwriter. And it's sort of like, it's a big world out there, right? There's a lot yeah. of other things that you can do instead of right. just making, you know, the McKee seminars about structure, not, not to knock those because those are essential pieces. But I had an instinct of wanting to be expansive, to be in this cool environment where I could study a broad range of stuff. And for the first time, you know, and who knows when I would need to do all of it. Um, and I think that's important. I always, I always try to encourage young writers to do that. And, you know, I think back a lot, one writer who I admire a great deal is Dennis Lehane. Um, and you look at his list of jobs, he was like a bartender and a bookseller. And like, he was out there sort of just doing stuff. And obviously he was reading fanatically. So with Dennis, I mean, you can really see he, he writes with such like humanity and intimacy and knowledge of people and different backgrounds. And I don't mean you have to go do exactly the background you're writing about, but you just get a sense when you're reading him that he's someone who's, who's, been, a, who's been a human in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah, you have a rich environment. Yeah, but, you know, we had an advantage to that. Like now I feel like people know so much about publishing and agents and who's doing, like I didn't know anything, right? Yeah. I mean, I was just at the back end of no internet. I wasn't going to VoucherCon. Like we didn't know all that. And so I think it's important that as much as we have all these tools at our disposal and all this access that we don't lose touch with the, the sort of the source passion. Like what are the things that really, really turn you on? Yeah. You know, I, when I talk to young people who, t you know, ask about writing and, and they, you know, what, what approach they should take, my answer is kind of along with what you say. I always say, don't, I'm not saying don't take writing classes, but study things that inform your writing. Don't necessarily study writing because as you may know, you, you, typical professors, unless they're really, really good, they're going to tell you a lot of rules that you end up breaking if you're a fiction breaking. writer. I mean, most of them, for, for instance. Yeah. But So I always say, inform, take things that inform your writing. More well, than that's right. And I bet if all five of us, you know, laid out what the ways we approach story and the rules mm -hmm. we glean from our experience, it's five different sets of things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Path and version is really different. So, you know, if somebody needs mentorship or needs advice, sometimes you can, you can lay out some offerings of stuff, but they have to pick and choose and make their own, you know, they figure out their own process. Um, you know, so it's interesting having that experience like in a TV writing room or, you know, working on a screenplay where it's much more interactive than novels. Yeah. And you start to realize like some people think of like the big high concept piece first you know, and other people, like for me, stuff starts to come with characters and scenes. Like it builds its way from the ground up. Mm -hmm. That's a huge difference. Yeah. You know, I don't start off being like, here's a thematic thing I want to do this episode about man versus nature. Like my brain just doesn't work that way. I'll yeah. start thinking, I'll start marinating and a scene will pop up in a scene in the character. And then I'll slowly start to recognize how they fit. But I start from the specific and work towards the thematic or the epic. And some people do the exact opposite. And I think that's just hard wiring, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you had mentioned earlier, um, you kind of stole half my question, so thank you. But I think we can work <laughs> around. Um, you're getting really good at that. I think you know what we're thinking. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's the psychology that means we're, predict that means we're predictable, um, Eric. <laughs> exactly, yeah. John slipped me the answers early, so. <laughs> when you, uh, so you knew you wanted to write novels ever since. Um, and went to Harvard. And then for your master's degree, going to Oxford and study Shakespearean tragedy was there a conscious decision that studying Shakespeare and going to that 
would be a asset as you in, as you wrote the novels and how often do you look back at that now and think about what you learn there that helps craft you know the, the narrative hmm, such a good question um it was like at the time my only conscious thought was so i had all these roommates going on to be doctors and lawyers and people going into eye banking and they're starting salaries one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, which sounds like 11 billion dollars <laughs> <laughs> Right. Here I am, like, <laughs> I'm the dipshit who studied English and psychology going, <laughs> uh, I kind of want to write a novel. <laughs> um, and so I applied for fellowships and I won um, a couple fellowships to go study and have it be paid for in England. And I don't want to, I don't want to denigrate it to say it was like a stall tactic to finish my first novel because I loved it. It was an amazing experience and it was something that I did wholeheartedly and with joy. But it was really like, I didn't know what else to do. I don't have any marketable job skills. Like I've never, you know, like one summer I valet park cars and crashed a car in full view of a whole wedding party. <laughs> <laughs> My first summer back home from Harvard, I went home. I remember getting back sophomore year. And I'm like, what'd you guys do? And, and like all these other students were like, well, I went back and helped, you know, Gorbachev try to reassess the, the rebirth of the Russian economy. Like people were in think tanks. Like, what'd you do? I literally was working swinging a sledgehammer at firehouses with prison release workers. <laughs> I have zero job skills at all. I kind of went to England to go, I love Shakespeare, right? I love, I love the work that I'm doing and it buys me a year that's all paid for for me to edit this book and when I was there I got my attorney first and then I got an agent and then I wrote the book and then in an unbelievable stro stroke of luck I sold it you know I was still a kid I mean I think I was 23 and yeah, so wow. I had to have a real job I mean so the first thing I did was you know like I just budgeted out for me money was only um like fuel in the gas tank. I'm like, if I only live on X a month, like $2,000 a month, how many months of writing do I have? Like that's the only thing that writing was for me. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I sold this book and then I was two and a half years before I sold my second book. And, you know, it was a lot harder. I think we went to 40 publishers or imprints and the 41st one bought it, a little imprint of HarperCollins. Mm. But I was just running out of money. And so that was really my mentality was like, Anything I can do to keep, you know, like when I did a deal, I'm like, awesome, that's 18 months of writing, right? That's, or if I did a screenplay polish, that's six months of writing. It's, it, that was like the currency, like cigarette packs in prison, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and as for Shakespeare, um, you know, I think in, in ways that are so much deeper, that just influences a lot of how I think about things, you know? In, in, in fiction, you know, in crime fiction too, um, you look at crime fiction and a person has to open the door to unforeseen or disastrous consequences through some act of their own, right? A good thriller doesn't just write about when bad things happen to good people because that's just real life, right? That's paper yeah. cancer. That's a plane crash. Right. And so when we're writing fiction, like what, what differentiates narrative fiction is that the character's approach and impact of the world creates the problems that they then contend with right and so i have that baked in with evan but you look at shakespearean tragedy and it's again it's like everyone's strength is their weakness right you have coriolanus who's the greatest soldier but his arrogance gets in his way right you have king leader's hubris you have macbeth's ambition and so in a weird way these things are sort of writ large because it's it's kings and it's country and it's it's royalty um, but that's what we're doing. And noir is like the very blue collar version of tragedy has been said, you know, by before. Um, but, but with crime fiction too, it's all the way that you think of like, how does somebody in the humanity that you try and capture seat them at the center of an intrigue of a problem of a journey that they have to go through and in going through, will have to confront the parts of themselves that, that partially place them there. Hmm. It's like, that's what, fiction is. And I don't think I understood it that clearly. I, when I was doing it, I think I probably would have had a more superficial answer, but the further I get on, the more I'm like, Oh, that's, that's it. Like that's what the Greeks wrote about with tragedies. That's what Shakespeare was playing with. It's right? therapy right. almost in a way. It's, it's therapy. <laughs> right. So, so is, is, right. And all of the, like with thrillers, what's so weird is you look at it and it's like, 
right? The, I remember in high school, you know, we studied the Greeks and it's like, you know, suffering is knowledge. And you're like, oh, okay, like that's a good multiple choice answer. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but as we get older, you start to actually realize that. It's like you, the things that we learn that are the hardest, that we're not seeking to learn, come in through us through death or illness or financial problems. Like that's where you learn your grit. That's where you learn who you are. Sure. And it's a really interesting thing that, that the structure of, of a thriller does that, right? Like right. what's the therapeutic structure? What's the Freudian cathartic technique? It's like you come in and the thing of the greatest value is in the place you want to look, right? You've been traumatized or abused as a child and it's impacting negatively your emotions in the world. Now it's conflicting with your emotion with your spouse or your kid. Go back to the source to lance that wound that you've spent your whole life protecting. Yep. In a weird way, that's what we see in, that's what tragedy is too, but we see that in thrillers, right? Where someone does something, it creates chaos and they have to go to the source of the chaos where they least want to go, where it's the most dangerous. And, and in order to try and come out with some, to reclaim some piece of themselves. I and think that's you just described book. the born books. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And, you know, in every, you know, archetypal myth, every, you know, young assess the myth, what's a myth about, right? Like a guy you know, you go to Beowulf's, you know, Grendel's coming and he's eating everyone in the village. And if you hole up and hide, you just get more and more, you know, locked up and eventually you'll get devoured by your problem. But if you face it voluntarily, if you're willing to go out and confront it against all odds. And I think about that great Raymond Chandler in Trouble is My Business, right? Down these street, yep. you must go. If you confront it voluntarily, it doesn't mean you won't get devoured. It doesn't mean you won't die. It doesn't mean it won't beat you. But you have a chance to slay the dragon right. or the right. creature. And what is the dragon guard in every archetypal story? You know, a mound of gold. And you're like, right. why the hell does a dragon care about gold? And it's like, <clears> well, that's, that's the knowledge. That's the wisdom, right? That's the thing that you get when you slay the dragon and you get to bring back, whether it's to yourself or you bring, you know, you bring back Grendel's paw and you nail it above the mantle. Right. To show other people, here's how you do this, yeah. right? I'm showing you how you confront that. And that's true psychologically. It's true in the outside world. It's true in the inside world. It's true for us. It's true in, for Evan Smoke. It's true when we read stories to see what is the story of how someone did this. Yeah. So, so Greg, uh, in the past, you've written a fair amount of comic books and you got a lot of comic book paraphernalia behind you. I mean, yeah. some really cool stuff. Uh, and you've written some of like my favorite characters, the Batman, uh, Punisher, X-Men, Wolverine, especially, but it's been a while since you've actually worked in comics. At least I think it's been a while. So do you have any desire to drive back into those worlds and, and into those characters? Yeah. So, um, it's funny, you're a Punisher fan. So I have behind me, which the, the, the Dude. enormous nerds in the, in the audience will know is Spider-Man 129, which is the first of <laughs> the Punisher. Yeah, which I love the Punisher. Punisher was such an influence on me. The anti-heroes, right? Punisher, Batman. Um, and, you know, it was great writing them. And I got to a point that I didn't want to work more unless it was create, unless it was something I could create of my own, you know? Mm, right. And my editor-in-chief of Marvel, for a long time, the editor-in-chief of Marvel was a guy called Axel Alonzo, who is a dear friend. He's the one who brought me into comics. And he recently started a new comic book company called AWA with, you know, a number of, and brought a number of us into a creative council to help sort of oversee and steer a new mythology to build another company the way that Marvel was built and DC was built. And so I'm going to be writing some of the launch works for that. And it's my first return to comics in like, gosh, seven, eight years probably. Dude, that is awesome. Nice. But here, so here's a cool thing though. You got Hulk behind you. I mean, yeah. he's pretty big and large, but you, oh, I don't think you've ever Hulk. written Hulk. I mean, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite comics I ever wrote was a Hulk with an Isad Ribic, who's a Croatian artist who paints every page on an easel, was supposed wow. to do it, and he got halfway in, and he's so, he, he did the Loki graphic novel. He's so amazing that Marvel pulled him on other projects and it was never finished. Scripts. <laughs> <laughs> Would you remind me? I got to contact someone at Marvel and go, let's restart that. But look at this. So this Hulk was a gift, and this is going to be trivia for you guys of who bought this for me. <laughs> is that ceramic? What is that? It's a cookie is, jar. It's a cookie it's jar. jar. Did you see the tattoos that were added? Yeah, what's yeah. with the arrows? Well, Joe yeah. Pike action. That's right. 
Wow. Oh. So that was a gift from uh, Robert Craze. Wow. Oh, um, dude. Sean loves Robert yeah, Craze. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's... Yeah. We have a picture I gave him of my dogs with the arrows because he's, you know, one year he had tattoos for his book launch, <laughs> all the Joe Pike. <laughs> And so I set my dogs in. And I think my, my youngest daughter was a baby. And I like put a tattoo. So she's in her onesie. <laughs> uh, so he got me the Hulk, which is kind of great. Dude, that's that's, that's, awesome. that's really cool. It. A little Pike Hulk that. matchup. Like a match <laughs> matchup. <laughs> so, you know, you are, like you've mentioned before, you're in these different realms within in media. So how would you describe the, the difference in your fan base from novels to your script writing to your comic base? Do you see a delineation of your fan base uh, along those lines at all? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's a clean answer by demographic, and there's mm. crossover. Like the Venn diagram's tricky between yeah. them. There's some people who just love stories and love narrative, right? There's narrative addicts and junkies, like I'd imagine, you know, all five of us. Yeah. <laughs> who, you know, are watching TV and love thrillers and love comics and go to movies and read a lot. <laughs> um, you know, I'd say the book, the novel reading audience tends to be a bit older, probably. Mm -hmm. You know, comics is all ages. You go into comics and you get guys who are like me. You know, I, one of the things I, you know, it's like, they'll, they were writing Batman before I was born. They'll be writing Batman after I was dead, right? It's a yeah. public trust that gets carried generation to generation and reflects some different things about it. And so, you know, that's very rangy. There's a, um, there's a pureness and childlikeness to comics and Comic-Con. Um, I love going to Comic-Con. Um, I went down <laughs> with Batman and was, you know, the last time I went, I was one of the guests of honor and Howard Chaikin. I had Howard Chaikin interview me because he was um, A, he's like manic and crazy and brilliant. <laughs> just, I'm very fond of him and he's a huge crime fiction fan. And there's just this energy there where, you know, like I'm signing in a lot, there's a big line and um, Scott Snyder had had his like uh, the owl, he'd done his, the court of owls theme and th there was all these masks and there's a little kid in the back and, you know, I had one and we ran out. And so you call the kid forward and sign the mask. And like, that's the energy everybody has. It's like, everybody's connected with this real childhood whimsical part of them. So there's a real sweetness at Comic-Con because you're sort of there to just, Everyone who's there has kept that part of themselves alive. You yeah. Know? Hell yeah. Um, with novels, I, I think there's a, um, you know, I love going out on book tour. I'm going out pretty wide. I'm going, I'm doing two weeks in the U S the end of January, early February, and then I'll do a week in England and all the stuff will be up on my website. But I, I love going to that. And it tends to be people who are, um, they're more, embedded and engaged. the questions are more emotional and psychological it feels like people are, are more um ground into those parts and I, I think there's something really unique you know i'm not the first person to say it, but we think about when you write a novel if i sell you know a million copies of orphan x there's a million different movies that play in a million people's brains like it's, true. it's, really, it's cool. there's a real intimacy to it it's right cool thought. Yeah. yeah it's a cool thought yeah, and so, yeah. like all four of you read a different version of Into the Fire, right? You, and you build it, we build, we, we, we put ourselves into the book with our own vulnerabilities, with our fears. And it's one of the things when you're writing, you try to leave room. You try and point people towards an emotion, but not state the emotion so that right. they bring more of themselves. You, you enlist them in the, the collaboration that's the recreation of the story you're writing when they read it. So there's this real intimacy to that. Whereas in a comic, it is rendered, right? In TV and film, it's rendered already. Right. And obviously they can be deeply emotional and affecting. And I've had experiences where movies are way more affecting than certain books that I read. But there's a sort of internal nature to the process of reading books and thrillers that I think makes it, um, it makes people feel closer to it in some ways. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So let, let's talk real quick again about Into the Fire, which I, I freaking loved. Um, and you mentioned earlier about how you kind of peel, have been peeling the onion back on Evan from novel to novel. And this one in particular, I felt like we got a lot more of Evan's internal life and it didn't slow the narrative down at all, which is a, a trick in itself. Um, have you ever considered kind of uh, doing a prequel book on Evan, kind of like fleshing out some of the, the many influences and incidences of his life that have kind of shaped him going forward? 
Hmm, it's funny you asked that question. Mm. <laughs> Good question. Um, I'm getting to it in places. Um, you know, like the opening of Out of the Dark goes back to his first mission as um, Orphan X. You know, so um, it opens with him in a gray Eastern European city as a 19-year-old who's just sat down embarking on his first mission, which is an um, like a really elaborate assassination. And I'm going to continue to do that with the books and tease out pieces of his background. Um, and there's a short story I wrote called um, By a Bullet that tells his first mission is the Nowhere Man the first time he switched from being Orphan X to the Nowhere Man. Um, and so one of the things I enjoy a lot, and I didn't get this right on the rough draft of Orphan X. I wrote a rough draft of Orphan X. I, I had come off a long run of writing standalones. And I wrote all sorts of, like, too, too many scenes, right? I, I'd written his first missions. I wrote about his childhood. I wrote about the foster home. I wrote about Jack. I wrote, I wrote this whole world out, and it was too long. And I owe a lot of credit to um, a couple of people. One is my editor, Keith Kayla at St. Martin's Press. At Min mm -hmm. it, he, was, he read it at St. Martin's. I'm now at Minotaur, um, which is under the umbrella of um, Macmillan. And, you know, he sort of reoriented me towards the fact that, that this being a series that I knew was going to be a series, I'd kind of been afraid of it. I had it on the back burner. I wrote another book first, then another book, then another book. <laughs> I'm pushing for next off that what we want to do is piece those out as people get to know a character and then there's a new mystery and then there's a new answer. And I had a dinner when I was in New York with Lee Child, who I think does this so beautifully with Reacher. Um, and actually what made me think of it. Yeah. I mean, Lee, and Lee's also one of those people who I'm so, there are certain people you're, one is just thankful for in the crime fiction community. Like Lee is always such a class act, right? He's always, blurbed everyone it's a handout he's not bullshitty like he's yeah. very direct he's very honest um and he takes his craft really really seriously but he doesn't take himself too seriously like he's there's a lot of in him that i think is really admirable and he and so you know i'm, I'm very fond of lee and um we sat down to dinner and i was just talking to him about this and he, he was sharing a little bit of of his thoughts about how he's managed that with reacher and i think it's i think it's really been interesting you know and so there's a template for how you do that that i had to sort of i'd done a series earlier in my career but i'd done standalone so many times and it's it's funny because i feel like tv is getting closer to the novel series mm -hmm. form mm -hmm. it's probably why i'm back into tv more than at earlier points in my career um and it's a little bit of a different mindset and so at the start of orphan x i had to kind of reacquaint myself with that and those were two of the touchstones for me Awesome. Hmm. Well, Greg, you, you've survived the, the main portion of the interview. Um, but we have this little thing we call the lightning round. And um, we all grow up with parents that say, hey, think before you speak. This is that part of the show where we like you not to think so much before you speak. Um, <laughs> and we might tick off your parental figures, but um, that's just how we do things. Um, so if you're up for it, we have the lightning round. We'll, we'll ask you some quick questions and give us what comes off the top of your head. All right, let's go. Ready for it? All right. My first question. What is the coolest DARPA development you have come across during your research? Um, bullets that can bend in the air. That was mine too. I love that. <laughs> that's, that's such a badass scene. Um, all right, question. Second question. What is the best screenplay pitch you have ever heard of or done yourself? I've been working with... I've been overlapping a lot with Billy Ray, the screenwriter, mm -hmm. on, politi on the political work. And one of the things with Billy is a bit of a longer answer, but he's, he's so good at doing the high concept. And he's right now shooting, he adapted and is directing the James Comey book um, for CBS. It's going to be a four-hour TV film miniseries mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. And when he was up for that job, he read Comey's thing and he had, was on the, on the call with Comey and said, this is, a, this is a love story between a man and an institution. <laughs> and like Billy can do that so well when he describes or breaks apart other, like even other movies he didn't write. He's, he manages to get it down all the way to that. And I thought that was pretty brilliant. Um, um, because pretty and I guess Comey went, went for it. <laughs> yeah. right, sorry, I'm going to try and lighten it up. Yep. No. <laughs> no, that's okay. Like it, it's, it's your pace. Okay, uh, next one. You adopt a teenager... You adopt teenager and hacker extraordinaire Joey. 
What does she constantly <laughs> mock about you? <laughs> All the same shit she mocks about. <laughs> OCD, like, wanting things cleaner, wanting things neater, um, <laughs> making fun of me for ways that I'm inadvertently more arrogant than I like to think I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, making fun of me missing references that are younger. Uh huh. All right, like my fourth question: <laughs> Has there ever been a time in your life when you would have called one eight hundred nowhere? Yes, but I can't answer when. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> yes, yes no, it. it's fine. Yes, no, it's fine. <laughs> um, and my last question, my last question is: What other fictional character would you think would make the most challenging adversary for Orphan X? Hannibal Lecter. Oh, yeah. Hannibal. Oh, Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, that's a good one. Or the other one I will say is Yago. And there was a critic who just who described Yago as having motiveless malignancy. Ooh. And it makes it really hard with Yago because he's not just a serial killer or someone who's, in, who's crazy because then you can't really do much with the narrative because it's like, well, why'd they kill people? He's crazy. Yeah. But Yago is so pointed with his power games and it's impossible to attach what his motivation is rather than just destruction. So he's like a, he's a precursor to the Joker in a way. Oh yeah. It's a good description. Some just want to watch the, the world burn. <laughs> Pretty cool. I thought you would have said Hulk, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've got a couple here. Most expensive vodka you've ever drunk. I've had some of the Stoli limited edition elites. They get very, very expensive. My favorite one that is expensive, it's $200 expensive, not $5,000 expensive, yeah. is Kaufman Vintage. Okay, write that down, people. You're done. All right. Number two, which professional soccer player takes the most obnoxious dives? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> so hard. Um, <laughs> my, you can I just say the Italian team. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that works. <laughs> All right, number three, who has more groupies, high jumpers or pole vaulters? Okay, yeah, definitely pole vaulters. I'm insulted you even asked that question. <laughs> We're just confirming. <laughs> All right, your dogs have the ability to talk for 10 minutes. What's their biggest complaint about you? More food. More, more food. <laughs> <laughs> the big one hits California, and you can grab one luxury item from your house before it sinks into a giant sinkhole. What do you grab? Amazing Spider-Man 129. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> amen <laughs> brother yeah. amen. priorities right there priorities. <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> or a, bottle, a bottle of blanton single barrel uh that'll get you through oh go with spider-man yeah go with spider-man we'll get you the, mm -hmm. we can get more blanton <laughs> Part of All right. guys. i mean you know yeah stuff not trendy one more one more uh uh i'm up one more you know soccer question who's your favorite american soccer team I mean, it's the women's World Cup team. If okay. that, yeah, they're done with dominant. There you yeah. go. I would, I would say DC United, but that's okay. Um, so Batman and Wolverine are squaring off. Who wins and why? Well, wins is tough. This is the super nerd answer. <laughs> that's what we came here. You can't beat Wolverine because he's got an adamantium skeleton and he can regenerate. And in fact, he's healing ability. Yeah. Um, but I wrote a comic in which he's completely disintegrated. It was one of those funny things where like I'm on the phone with the Marvel like think tank trust of how long the regeneration would take, right? Like it's all this stuff. So I think Wait, there is such a thing. Batman is, oh yeah, there's, oh, yeah. there's hardcore where I'm like, can he be rejuvenated within X amount of time? Because right. I want to have this adamantium skeleton, like, the ter like when Terminator burned off. Uh, so it's actually impossible to defeat Wolverine, but I think I would give Batman the edge in a fight. But you can't win the battle against Wolverine. Hmm. All right. I named my kid Logan, by the way. Um, <laughs> specifically for that. His name's Logan James. So uh, true or false, there are interstate highways in Hawaii. True. Go Very figure. Good. There are. <laughs> um. What was your favorite elective in college? Opera or abstract expressionism? Hmm. Opera. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, mine was or, intro. Or I, took, I took a course on Frank Lloyd Wright that was great too. Yeah, that actually be pretty cool. And yeah. so now if Evan Smoke had to kill Eric Bishop, how, how would he do it? How would he do it? 
Yeah. yeah. How would he kill Eric? Easily. <laughs> oh, shut up. Sneaky. I think shattered uh, vodka bottle to the throat. Yeah. That's Easy a good way to go, Eric. I'm okay yeah. with that. Just, <laughs> just you, leave Greg. his body. Just leave <laughs> his body. Leave. Leave, Eric. We'd be friends. You guys are so violent. <laughs> I tell you. I have to put up with it every week. A different way to kill me or do something You to came me. up with the way to kill him, but yeah, I you're like it. Like, you're, you're basically like Kenny in South Park. Yeah. Essentially, yes. yes. <laughs> Pretty much. You Bastards. killed Eric. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. I'm the first replacement they get rid of one day. So. That's our next graphic, Chris. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. What? So I'm up. This is your final, final go, final round. So uh, Evan walks out of his uh, high rise, walks down to the liquor store, and they're out of vodka. What is he grabbing next? Oh, see, it's so hard to not put myself in his shoes. I think he would go with gin. Go with and gin. Little known fact is that, well, I shouldn't say little known, but often people don't know that gin isn't British in origin. It's Dutch um, because it's so associated with the Brits. And there's a Dutch gin called Bobby's that's great because it's got all the Indonesian spices and cardamom that underlie mm. it. And if mm. you pour it with elderflower flavored tonic through an orange slice, it's a transcendent version of a gin and tonic. And so I think he'd stay with the clear spirits because they're still the cleanest. And that particular combination would be well suited to him. I'm writing that down. Damn, that's, that's, a, that's one of the that's best. An awesome answer. Answer. That's the best answer we've ever had on the show. It was ridiculously <laughs> great. That's the most intellectual answer we've ever had on the show. And it's about liquor. So I was great. blown away by that answer, by the way. Or intellectual. It just depends on the way you look at it. So you've taught us the uh, fourth commandment says never make it personal. But what happens if Evan is locked in a cell with Jeffrey Epstein? Obviously, several months back. Uh, does he break his commandment? <laughs> Um, same outcome for Jeffrey Epstein. Same <laughs> outcome. He talks him into su suicide. He, he talks, talks him into it. <laughs> he crafts the he crafts the rope for him. Really. So, um, most overrated movie of all time. Boy, that's me. I hate to ever criticize things. Um, that's so weird. I don't frame things in that way as much. You guys, give me, you guys, give me yours while I think. Here, here's here's a better way to say that a movie that the masses seem to love that you just don't get. That's Titanic. fair. For me, that's Dog Day there Afternoon. There we go. That's a better. That's a Dog better. Day Afternoon. Oh, Dog Day Afternoon. Okay. I just don't. It's, it's long and wobbly and it didn't. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting for me to watch the performance and the talent that's in it, mm. but I don't get it as being a sort of um, transcendent piece of cinema. But it's also not the most overrated thing because there's a, there's a lot of art and craft in it, but I don't, I'm not drawn to it. And it doesn't kind of haunt me the ways that other stuff does. Hmm. Answer. Um, my, my, mine would be the notebook. Uh, Shakespeare and Love. <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare and Love. Hey, was Shakespeare and Love beat LA Confidential for Best Picture, didn't it? No. Okay. It was what? Saving Private Ryan. Oh, Private Ryan. that's right. Something beat LA Confidential that didn't deserve to beat LA Confidential. I don't remember what that was, but... How about your two? Michael? There's no, a, you oh mine? No, Let's yeah. see. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get crucified for this, but uh, uh, what the hell was the DiCaprio, Matt Damon, Scorsese movie? The, oh, the one. What's that? Oh, not The Departed. Yeah, uh, The Departed. The Departed. Departed. Yeah. I, I, it, it was not the transcendent movie that it seemed to be for so many people. I, I, I felt like I was, a I felt like the end was a little bit of a cheat and I hate when I feel that way about a, a movie, like where you watch mm -hmm. it and you get invested and then, and I, and I, and that was probably the point, the abruptness of, of, you know, DiCaprio's character. But I just, I felt like after that journey, I just, I, I didn't like the payoff. It was just me. So my, so mine, I, I guess maybe it's not overrated in some people's mind, but it, it was built up so big was for me, it was actually the um, Star Wars one, two, and three. I, I mean, four, five, and six were just epic. And so coming into one, two, three, Lucas was going to make this great follow up. And they're, they're hated by some, but there are, I know plenty of people that say, you know, they enjoyed it. And, uh, and most of the people that enjoyed it didn't grow up on the other three. I, yeah. I say, maybe we, we don't talk about those. We maybe that's the difference. Um, I, and I don't know how you take a series. I, I don't know how you take the four, five, and six and then screw it up. Well, he, so made, he made it for his younger kids is what, he, I know. is what he said on the record. And I think that it's evident when you watch it. So I guess mine would be more disappointing than overrated yeah. for that particular one. It's the one that disappointed me because I had so – I mean, I went and saw them and I thought, man, I grew up with these movies and I just was like, no. <clears throat> and my kids still try to ask – 
we watched uh, Phantom Menace a couple months back, and I watched it with them, but it was a struggle. Jar Jar came on, and I'm just kind of like, uh, you want popcorn? Let's uh, <laughs> go for a walk here for a minute. So, um, so besides your own, uh, two more questions. Keep it quick here. Besides your own series, or besides Orphan X, um, what book series or character should be on the big screen, or should you know should have a show, have a series on Netflix or or Prime? What's what's not there that should be there? Well, it's funny. I love. Um, I'm such a fan of Megan Abbott's work, but everything's on screen now. Which is, she's doing so well. You know that it. Um, you know, Dare Me's coming in a miniseries uh, or a TV show. I mean, um, she's. Uh, you know, my head goes to her. She's such a unique writer. Um, in terms of a, of an ongoing character, um, I'm trying to think who is who isn't. Grace won't sell the rights. So I was going to ask about that. Bob, Bob won't, isn't interested in selling the rights. He, he worked too long in TV, you know. <laughs> he knows how it works. Uh, Elvis would be so hard to cast, in my opinion. Elvis would? Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough one. Get it right. Um, I would, you know what I would love to see? This is, it's a different answer. I would love to see a new version. I've been going back right now and reading all, a lot of the early Robert B. Parkers. I'd love to see Spencer for Hire again. Um, oh, yeah. It's Spencer unbelievable Hire, yeah. how good those books are, the depth that they have, the social relevance. I just went back and read the Godwolf manuscript. His handling of, like, politics and culture and, and high school or college, you know, um, cultural flashpoints and gender and race, and he's just unbelievable. It's like some of the language is slightly outdated, but his approach to it is so open-hearted. And, you know, he's one of the first people who really took a, a PI and, and seated him in the real world in a way. Mm -hmm. huh. And I don't think I even registered how much of an influence that was for me with Evan, right? That there's that crossover of like, you know, you never, I, I say like, you never get to see James Bond go home or Jason Bourne. Yeah. Right. Awkward encounter with a single mom, you know, outside an HOA meeting. <laughs> and going back and reading um, the Spencer books, I'm just struck so much by how he's like cooking and giving advice and in altercation with his girlfriend where they're both, where there's no straw men in the argument, right? Where they both are having valid points of view. And I'd love to see a, a new version of, of him. That's another that That'd My final question, it's, it's track and field day, and you're, 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 you're deciding to pull something out of the closet. You, you pull out the pole, and you're going to you're gonna go pole vault. You're going to go have a good day. You twist your ankle at the last second. Which of the four of us is, is stepping in for you? Which, one of, which of the four of us can, could handle that? <laughs> <laughs> we, t we take our questions very seriously, obviously. I'm thinking Sean. Wow. You're really a six-foot-five guy? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that. The height, the Good vodka also, for that. The height is a big starting advantage with the pole. Uh huh. And so is the weight. A, you're halfway there. Yeah, he's halfway there. He's halfway there. <laughs> the leverage point is is tall. That's why like Sergey Bubka was like a big, tall, hulking guy. You know? Yeah. I'm mm. nice, but he's got to start training now. Yep. All right. I can't All wait right. to see it. Hell, he's in it. I know what I'm doing this week. I you are in it, that. dude. He's working a helmet. I guess I'll have to cut out the Christmas uh, cookies. Christmas eating. Yeah, st stop eating. <laughs> if you're at Thriller Fest next year, Greg. We'll set something out there on 42nd. We'll set it up for him and have him do a test. For you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God, I would kill myself. It's like there's no there's no pickup pole vaulting. I still play soccer. <laughs> pickup <laughs> pole vault. <laughs> unless, you're, unless you're training five hours a day, there's no doing it. Well, how did you transport those things? Obviously, you, you had to go to others. I mean, how the hell do you transport pole vaults? On a to, bus. You had the team bus, right? Hmm. What about or international? In mean, high school, we have to put it up mounted on the roof of the car. Mm. Wow. Um, but yeah, it was, it's funny. It's a sport that you're always, um, at least for me, there's always an element of fear. <sighs> It's like you're always, you're always aware that you could die or get horribly injured. Right. And if you're really confident, you can push it slightly to the back of your brain. But if you have a stumble, it's there. It's, it's, it's such a mental sport because it seems like it's a physical sport, but it's so mental. Oh, you're upside down. That pole snaps and you're halfway up. I mean, I broke, I broke a pole in college and I was like, 
it's that that full body shake it just snapped yeah. the edge of the pad and i went back down the room i was like give me another pull i have to jump right now or i'm never going to jump again if you yeah. think about it yeah if i left and hit the showers and got home i i would have never been able to do it you been know done. right i did just like a shitty really straightforward jump but <laughs> it's weird that's the equivalent we get back on the horse immediately yeah, real right. fast but i did it right away but it was that full body like where you're like like your whole nervous system <laughs> oh. like not, we're not designed for that you know no, no. This is like, hey low iq this isn't what we're designed for <laughs> <laughs> Dar- darwin baby darwin says do it it sounds like our show actually Pretty yes, much. exactly. <laughs> well, Greg, we, we've really been thrilled to have you tonight. We really appreciate you coming on and some of the best answers we've ever had on the show. And I'm, yeah. I'm not just saying that because you're on there. I'll, I'll say it to the world. Um, tremendous, tr- tremendous night. Really appreciate it. You survived okay. the lightning round. Yeah, no, I, this was a lot of fun for me too. So I appreciate cool. it. Cool. This is a great book and I urge everybody to pre-order it, buy it, read it. And if you haven't read the entire series, start with book one and run right through them because okay. you will thank you gentlemen All right cheers thank to you, you. Cheers. cheers thank you greg appreciate it take care one thanks tonight's guest greg herwitz author of the orphan x series and this great book into the fire which comes out january 28th subscribe to our youtube channel like us on twitter and catch us every monday on the crew reviews. See you next week. Gentlemen. Another good one, boys. Cheers. <laughs> Today's it. bloopers are brought to you by Reka Vodka <laughs> from Iceland. Small batch. It's good stuff. <sighs> I like it. All right. Are we ready? Sure. Okay. Kind of ready, ready to roll there. I got it recording and it's on you. Go ahead. We'd like to thank our guest tonight, Greg Hurwitz, whose Into the Fire comes out January 28th. <laughs> Damn it, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, dude. Here come the hits. You know what? That's a good you better point. go to individual. <laughs> 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 Just look at yourself. <laughs> <laughs> to be or not to be, Greg Hurwitz. Talking poll talk now. Dude, he picked you to for the poll vote, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> He's never met you. <laughs> no. hey, I, I'll have you know, uh, I actually have done poll vote before. Oh, you haven't. Liar. Yeah. Three, Nine. two, gone. I'd like to thank tonight's guest, Greg Hurwitz, for coming on the crew reviews and spending time with us. <laughs> Dude, I love Sean. <laughs> God, I'm just like, if you would let me start right away, I would have been fine, but it's all this preamble pressure <gasps> under pressure this is dun, 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 dun. make sure that we use eric's uh, queen uh, impression there at some point do it no that th- oh that was his impression that's i thought that was just him <laughs> i was just all singing right. all right here we go three two hmm. <laughs> <think Greg Irwin's- laughs> his face was so like oh goodness sorry okay. are you done i'm done I'm not oh, that sure was good. <laughs> This is the best part of the show. God, I love it when Sean's just going to do all the shows. That's you should do saying. all the closing. You should yes. do all the shows. Get out there and start reading this series right away if you haven't started it. What? Again. Just <laughs> That's not us. I don't know where. I know that wasn't you that time. I just stared at the camera. didn't even didn't even breathe for two minutes. So. <laughs> it's like the price is right. Girl. <laughs> well, this guy sucks. Stay new to your pets. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> Into the Fire, which comes out January 28th. Buy it, as Chris would say. Do it. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> Cut. What, what? I was like, where am Dude, I going? It was so good. Why it was. It was. It, so was. it was fantastic. It was really good. Buy it. Follow us on Twitter. Like our stuff on Facebook. <laughs> Shave my beard. <laughs> Don't worry, Bruce can walk home. It's okay. <laughs> oh, I got to pick up my Damn niece, it. too. Yeah, she can walk with him. Apparently. Don't say Twitter. Okay. Don't say Twitter. <laughs> that word's like a trigger word for you. <laughs> it is. It is. Okay. All right. Stop. One of these days, I'm going to do this perfect the first time, and you guys are going to be sitting there going, oh, I didn't hit record. No.
Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's no doing it perfect. <clears throat> there's Sean's way, and then there's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. His new novel, Into the Fire, next one in the Orphan X series, comes out January 28th. Buy it. Like our show on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Why, he, why, did why, he did it again. No, don't oh say Twitter. God. Google us. Find us. If you don't know where we're at, then who the hell are you? That's right. <clears throat> that you fantastic. said Twitter and you still got through it. I, I think this is a big breakthrough for I you. I said YouTube first. That was the key. I think, yeah. I have you guys off to the side so I don't see you doing <laughs> the crazy things Stupid you did shit. early. <laughs> I swear that first take would have been perfect if it wasn't for Chris doing jazz hands. <laughs> That's it. I got what I need from you guys. Thanks for All right. Well, we'll see you Good later. Good to have you on. Appreciate it. <laughs> that was the shortest crew reviews ever. So Most successful, too. Up. You expect me to stick around and talk to you? Yeah. I could talk. No. Uh, but these boys will start fighting, and it sounds like Wookiees mating. Just- <laughs> <laughs> I'm concerned that you know how that sounds. Uh, yeah. Eric, 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 right? You know how that sounds. <laughs> Name, please. Are, are, we, are we done? <laughs>